Um, welcome everybody to the London Vegans meeting for January 2021. And uh, if you haven't, if I haven't already said to you, a happy new year to you all. Um, this is our first of the meeting. We have a meeting intended for the last Wednesday of each month. And for today's meeting, I'm very pleased to announce we have Stephen Walsh from the Vegan Society. He's on the council as one of the trustees of the Vegan Society. I've known Stephen for many years. Uh, you may, some of you may already know him. He's the author of Plant-Based Nutrition and Health and helped in the formulation of the Veg One supplement for the Vegan Society. And I'm sure Stephen's going to tell you more about that and supplements, what we do need, what we don't need. Um, so let me, if I can spotlight Stephen. Uh, there you are. Um, let me hand over to Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Brian. Nice to see so many faces, quite a few familiar, some, some new ones. Always good. Uh, as Brian says, I'm going to talk about nutritional supplements for vegans. Uh, I've got, I think, 15 slides. Um, I'm going to start by talking a bit about diet, because I don't think you can really sensibly recommend supplements for people without first addressing the base, which is diet. Because supplements are certainly not the solution for everything. So I'll just see if I can share my screen. you see that? Yeah, okay. All right. So just as a bit of a warm up, I, I want to put the supplementation into context. It's no substitute for a healthy diet. And almost every supplement producer or recommender will put this as a footnote, but I think it's really central to considering supplementation. Because the sort of supplementation I'm going to talk about is intended to comp very much to complement a healthy mm -hmm. diet, a healthy vegan diet, uh, and not at all to be a substitute for that. I could give you my own personal opinions, uh, but actually given the amount of research that goes on, I prefer to start from uh, the Global Burden of Disease study and look at their recommendations. And these are recommendations which aren't by vegans, they're by an organisation that works in tandem with the World Health Organisation to look at what factors are driving ill health across the globe and in different countries. And they have come up with dietary recommendations that they regard as giving the theoretical minimum risk in, in relation to diet and health. The, and there's, I'm just going to talk about seven of them. And I say they're the top seven. And they're the top seven in the sense that they're the seven that have the biggest impact. And as I'll show you in a minute, for the UK, they account for about 90% of the total impact of known factors relating to diet. And the first ones avoid excess salt, uh, which they define as no more than three grams of sodium a day. This is quite big as an issue for the UK, but it's even bigger uh, in countries like China, where salt intake is much higher. Next recommendation is eat 125 grams of whole grains a day. And this is the weight before processing. So you, know, you might be eating rice, obviously, if it's dry and it's cooked, it's a completely different weight but we're really talking about dry weight here. So about 125 grams uh, of whole grains a day. Uh, 250 grams of fruit a day, which is equivalent to about three portions in UK terms. 20 grams of nuts and seeds. 400 grams of vegetables a day, which is equivalent to five portions in the UK recommendation. And they specifically, as of the past couple of years, say one, one of those portions should be legumes. Uh, for a long time, they just said vegetables, but recently they specifically separated about legumes. Uh, to get 250 milligrams a day of long chain omega 3s, and that's specifically EPA and DHA, which are classically the, the fish oil omega 3s. 
and a foiled processed meat. So these are pretty much in order to put importance globally. Uh, and they're also the top seven for the UK. So I'm failing to meet these recommendations. So when they compare people's actual diet to these recommendations and they estimate the impact on health, these seven account for about 90% of the estimated impact of diet on health. Mm. A nice thing about these recommendations is that they leave a lot of flexibility for individual choice and preference. Even in how you meet them, you have a lot of choice. It's not saying you have to eat brown rice, wholemeal bread, oats. Uh, it's just saying 125 grams of whole grain, some form, some mixture, whatever suits you. But what also means there's a lot of choice left to the individual is when you add these up and you put, put calories to them, they only account for about 800 calories, roughly, 800 kilocalories, uh, which is less than half the average person's energy intake. So you, you're still left with a lot of choice of what you do with the rest of your diet, as well as a lot of flexibility for how you meet these recommendations. So just to illustrate the impact, this is for the UK. And the way they look at impact is they look both at years of life lost due to death and a sort of estimated years of life impaired less than they could be through disability from illness and ill effect. And they add those together to get disability adjusted lost years due to diet. And when you look at the breakdown of that, you can see that for the UK, the you get a, more or less the same impact from we don't eat enough fruit and we don't eat enough whole grain. Uh, next is we don't eat enough nuts and seeds. We don't eat enough vegetables. Uh, gradually getting a bit smaller, but still pretty comparable. We eat too much sodium, too much salt. Uh, we don't get enough EPA and DHA. Uh, and we, as an overall population, obviously not vegan, eat too much processed meat. And then there, there, there's about 13 or 14 calories altogether, but the others, which include things like too much red meat, uh, too little milk, uh, in terms of their, their, their estimates, uh, they're all fairly minor. You know, those seven really do account for the essence of their recommendation. Uh, and that makes it very easy to build a simple message around those recommendations. Now, I don't think they're absolutely the last word on this. The interesting emphasis on, in this Global Burden of Disease study, uh, which is a huge collaboration of researchers through the world, uh, debating the recommendations and updating them, is that their view is that the main benefit from your diet choices comes from limiting salt and processed meat and including adequate amounts of health promoting whole plant food and relatively minor contribution but significant long the long chain omega-3. So it, it's primarily about including healthy food is the primary focus. There's a few limiting things with the processed meat and salt, but primarily the they say the health of your diet comes from the amount of health promoting foods you include. Other studies, I think it's important to note, put more emphasis on apparent adverse effects of what's called ultra processed foods. Uh, quavers, I think, are one of the classic examples. You know, foods where you really couldn't tell you know, what the ingredients looked like when they were in the field. Uh, concentrated sugars and refined grain. So some of our uh, research groups would put more emphasis on the negative effects of these. And obviously, to some extent, simply including the healthy foods displaces the unhealthy. So, so you still have a lot of flexibility. I would say within that flexibility, within the part that isn't pinned down by the Global Burden Disease recommendation, uh, it does seem prudent to limit these ultra-processed foods, concentrated sugars and refined grains. Uh, as well as following the, the core Global Burden Disease Study recommendation. One speci other specific I want to take up from other recommendations 
is some dietary guidelines specifically recommend orange and green vegetables. So rather than just having you know, four portions of vegetables plus a portion of legumes, they say some of those vegetables should be orange and green vegetables. Uh, and in fact, orange and green vegetables are possibly even more relevant to vegans than to the general population. There's a certain nutrients they provide that you can also get from animal products, but for vegans obviously you don't have those other sources. Um, I say you should include orange colored vegetables rich in beta carotene to provide vitamin A. And the sort of amounts you're looking at are about 500 grams a week of carrots or a kilogram a week of uh, orange sweet potatoes. And that deals with vitamin A requirements. And you should also include some leafy greens, uh, at least 500 grams a week of any combination of these, spring greens, kale, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. Broccoli is a reasonable alternative, not strictly leafy in the form we eat it, but uh, we also count turnip greens. That's all fine. Uh, this provides, in particular, vitamin K, uh, but also other nutrients. It can make a contribution to calcium, as I'll come to later. Uh, it also makes a contribution to the vitamin A. And it ensures that your vegetable intake is varied. So for all those reasons, uh, I thought it was important to highlight this additional dimension. And it's not terribly complicated. It's not a terribly long set of guidelines. But for the vast majority of people, following those guidelines would significantly improve their, their health. So having set that backdrop, that context, uh, onto supplements, um, I put them in more or less order, most important first in this list. When I come continue through the detail, I'll go from the bottom up. So I'll start from the ones that I think are important but have a bit less impact and work up the list. But you have vitamin B12, which I think there's really no qualifications on. You could say, oh, but what about fortified foods? I would say fortified foods are really just a particular way of taking your supplement. So I, I don't see fortified foods as qualitatively different. Supplement. Vitamin D, uh, as I explained, this depends very much uh, on how much sun exposure you get and where you live. Uh, but I'll explain that more later. Uh, for most of us, we don't get, living in the UK, certainly, uh, we don't get enough vitamin D from sun. And uh, supplements have a significant role to play. Well, I'll come to that. Adding and selenium, I'll cover jointly, because they're very much the same issue. Uh, the amount you get in plants depends entirely on where the food is grown. And it's fairly random, because plants will grow in soil that is essentially devoid of iodine and selenium. Plants don't need it, animals do. That's why iodine and selenium become an interesting issue for vegans. Uh, long chain omega 3s, uh, I've taken that from the Global Burden of the Sea study. Uh, some people would say they overemphasize it, uh, but I'm not about, despite doing a lot of research on this myself, when a study of that stature and that amount of resources makes the recommendation. I think by and large, we should take it seriously and just consider how in the vegan context, it's best to approach it. Calcium I put in, uh, is it, you can get calcium entirely from food. You can get it entirely from whole foods if you make a really big effort. Uh, but a lot of vegans don't. So I want to, to look at some recommendations on that. And if you find there's a deficit in what you're getting uh, from food sources, then supplements are a potential solution. So that's what I'm going to cover. Okay, so calcium. Um, my recommendation is to get at least 500 milligrams of calcium a day from rich bioavailable sources. And by that I mean sources that contain a significant amount of calcium, uh, so they're worth counting, counting up in your head. Uh, and where we know the calcium is well absorbed. Because there are a lot of foods that 
are thought of as rich in calcium, wherever we know they're not, the calcium is not well absorbed, or we don't know if it is or it isn't. So, for example, calcium in spinach, we know isn't well absorbed at all, because it's bound up with oxalic acid. And that applies to some other high oxalic acid vegetables, uh, like chard. And in terms of almonds and tahini, which are often mentioned in vegan nutrition books as a source of calcium, I really couldn't find any evidence that would let me say they're well absorbed or not. They're probably not as well absorbed as the sources in the table. I would guess about 50%, but I really don't know. So I wouldn't rely on something where we don't know the absorption. So in terms of the sort of things to include, where we know the absorption is good, uh, kale or spring greens have about 150 milligrams per 100 grams. Uh, would still require about 300 grams a day to get your full 500 just from that. And you can do it. Uh, at times in my life, I have. Uh, but it's not always convenient and it doesn't suit everybody. Uh, if you come to broccoli or cabbage, uh, significant amount of calcium, but much less than the real heavy hitters. So about 50 milligrams. Oranges are often a surprise to people. They weigh in at about 40 milligrams uh, per 100 grams. And you can eat, most people can eat a lot more oranges than they can uh, kale. So fortified plant milk, and I emphasize fortified because the soya bean itself, or oats, or whatever the base of the milk is, doesn't tend to have a huge amount of calcium itself. But most non-organic plant milks on the market in the UK, at least, will ha be fortified to get, have the equivalent amount of available calcium as cow's milk, which is about 120 milligrams per 100 milk. Tofu is an interesting one because it's sometimes made with calcium salt. And if it is, it can have very high levels. So if you had a very firm tofu, uh, it might have as much as 500 milligrams of calcium per 100 grams, and it is absorbed. Uh, but you could also have a, cal a tofu made with magnesium salt and having very little calcium. The cauldron one, which is the one of the most common ones in supermarkets, I think has 300. So tofu can be a good source. And my suggestion is that sort of you see it from these sort of you know, reliable, available sources, whether that covers your 500 milligrams a day. If it doesn't, uh, consider adding in some supplements or modifying what you eat. Uh, it's unfortunate that organic plant milks generally aren't properly fortified. There's one or two are fortified with, with calcium, I think from a, a coral or a seaweed, uh, which is accepted as organic, but most are not fortified because the standard calcium salts aren't accepted by organic standards. If you are using supplements, calcium carbonate is fine, but best taken with meals, and calcium citrate is also well absorbed with or without meals. Long chain omega 3s, in some ways, one of the most uncertain and complicated of topics. At one level, there's a very simple answer, which is if you take the Global Burden to Sea study recommendations, they suggest 250 milligrams of a mixture of EPA and DHA each day. And for omnivores, this points to oily fish. Uh, for vegans, it points to supplements, generally derived uh, from algae, uh, but processed to extract and concentrate the, uh, the long chain omega 3s. Uh, I think I mentioned Vegetology's Opti Free supplement because that's the one I've generally found to be cheapest. There are a lot of supplements that are all, all rely on uh, oils. Fats produced by Martech, uh, but they're sold at widely varying prices. And vegetology, I find to be relatively good value, but there's no getting away from the fact that this route is relatively expensive, about five pounds a month. Uh, I consider that a, a significant barrier. There are other things you could do with that. It's not for some people. It's a critical barrier. For some people, it's relatively minor, but there's an opportunity cost for everybody. Now, the alternative, which is that the body produces its own EPA and DHA, given the right mix of 
uh, plant fatty acids. Uh, so if you have adequate plant omega-3, I'd suggest about two tablespoons a day of rapeseed oil or ground flaxseed would give you adequate plant omega-3s. And you don't have excessive plant omega-6, which competes with them. And plant omega-6 means most seeds and, and their oils. So most high fat seeds will, will be rich in omega-6, sunflower seeds, for example. Uh, a lot of the oils, corn oil, grapeseed oil, uh, sunflower oil, are all very high omega-6 oils. And they compete in the body for conversion with the omega-3s. So while this second approach can be as cheap and simple as replacing other oils with rapeseed oil, and favoring nuts such as cashews, almonds, and hazelnuts over high omega-6 seeds, such as sunflower and sesame. Uh, it requires more of an adaptation of your diet than simply taking the, the preformed EPA and DHA from the supplement. So the long chain omega-3 supplement is more directly aligned with the global burden disease study recommendations and it allows greater freedom with your diet choices but it does involve significant cost. So different people will make different choices and different preferences come to bear, uh, such as whether you use vegetable oil, uh, whether you like flaxseed, uh, all factors for individual choice. But these are basically the, 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 the two options in this, in this area. So selenium and iodine, uh, as I mentioned in passing, the reason these are a vegan issue is that plants do not require selenium or iodine. So they'll grow in soil, low in these nutrients, and then they'll have low amounts of cells. They simply don't care. Animals uh, do require these nutrients. So if you had a farmed animal, the far and the, the soil was low in selenium, the farmers would supplement the animal's diet. Uh, so that then, because the animals need selenium, anyone who's using them for food will get selenium second hand. Whereas the plants grown in the same soil will just, in most countries, just randomly acquire whatever is there. In Finland, they add selenium to the fertilizer, but I think they're still pretty much the only country to do that. Uh, you could some foods that can act as sources. Seaweeds are often rich in iodine, sometimes far too rich. Um, Brazil nuts are famously rich in selenium, but the difficulty I used to recommend particular amounts to particular seaweeds and Brazil nuts. Uh, but in further research, it's done new research has come out. The difficulty is that the nutrient content is too, probably too variable. So you could have a 10 to 1 variation in how much selenium is in a, in a particular bag of Brazil nuts. Uh, and I think it's too variable really to be relied upon as the main source. The sorry, a sentence I skipped over. Uh, which provides a more reliable option in some ways, is if you eat plant foods grown in many different regions, then the risk of being deficient in iodine and selenium is, is relatively low, because the chances are some of that food will come from soil rich in these nutrients. It's a bigger risk if you eat just foods grown locally, uh, which then depends on the local soils. And in the, Back in the days when people did eat generally locally, we used to have a thing in the UK known as Derbyshire Neck, which was iodine deficiency goiter uh, in, induced by the, the low levels in, in the soil, particularly low levels in the soils around there. So I think here, I think a supplement is the simplest solution. And I would say 75 to 150 micrograms of iodine and 30 to 60 micrograms of selenium provide a safe insurance policy. And there's no clear evidence that any more is better. And some reason to think it may not be. Uh, it could even be worse. So vitamin D. Uh, the main source of vitamin D for all hum almost all humans is the action of sunlight and skin. The big exception is the uh, Inuit and other populations living uh, you know, very far north or south, uh, where they are deprived of sunlight for much of the year, but get uh, vitamin D from the large amount of seafood, 
that they eat. Uh, so they're not they're not primarily reliant on sunlight and skin, but almost everyone else is. And in the UK, uh, the sun is too low on the horizon to generate vitamin D in your skin in reasonable amounts uh, between October and February. And you see a very strong seasonal variation of uh, the blood vitamin D levels. Another complication is that darker skinned people require more sun exposure to make vitamin D. Uh, but the bottom line is that the ideal duration of sun exposure to get the benefit of vitamin D without unnecessary damage is about a third of the time that would leave the sunburn. And if you're in the middle of the UK winter, uh, it's very hard to quantify what that time is. So you, know, you just don't have much sun. You could stay a long time. You could expose all the skin you wanted. You'd have trouble keeping warm, but uh, you wouldn't make enough vitamin D. In terms of diet, the main sources in the UK are animal foods, particularly liver and oily fish, and also margarine, which is generally fortified. And while diet has less impact than sun exposure, UK vegans do show lower vitamin D levels than omnivores, particularly in, in winter. So it, it, it is, while well, it's an issue for everybody, it's slightly more of an issue for vegans. Uh, we've now got vegan vitamin D3 available, as well as D2. Uh, up until about six or seven years ago, D2 was the only vegan form. Vitamin D3 may be somewhat better absorbed and retained in the body. Uh, and is the form that is made in the body from sunlight. So for all those reasons, that now that we've got vegan D3, it seems to make sense to use it. It doesn't seem to push the price of supplements up greatly. So cost doesn't seem to be too big an issue. Not going to go through this slide in full detail, but it's an attempt to look at vitamin D production if you expose face, hands and arms to sun for five minutes at midday on the 21st day of each month with the clouds of sky and no sunblock, how much vitamin D could you expect your body to make? And I've shown here you've got a, a green line, which is a good uh, daily amount. It would should make, give you very good blood levels. Down here is the amount needed to provide Spent rickets. And then each of these lines is at a different latitude. So the orange line at the top corresponds to 30 degrees north. Uh, and that's, for example, Cairo, Delhi, and New Orleans. I find it quite fascinating which places are actually on the same latitude because we often have quite different images of them. Uh, but if you're living you know, on 30 degrees north, then for most of the year, this brief five minutes exposure will generate a good amount of vitamin D. Uh, during the summer, it will generate an abundance of vitamin D. As you move further away from the equator, the sun drops lower on the horizon. Uh, so you get less and less vitamin D generated from the same exposure. If you're at 64 degrees north, uh, so that's uh, Reykjavik or Archangel. Uh, you're you have a lot of the, the the year where you're making you're not even making enough to prevent rickets, even if you do religiously get this exposure, which as we'll come to a lot of us don't. And you have this vitamin D winter effect where there's the part of the year where you're really just drawn down the stores you built up over the summer, and they drop about. 50% every couple of months if there's no intake. Uh, and sunlight ceases to be an adequate source, so diet, the diet contribution, although smaller, becomes critical. If we go to you know, the UK, to London, 51 degrees north, that's the green line. There's only a very brief part of the year where this five minute exposure would be ample to get a, a really good amount of vitamin D. And there's a significant, oops, you know, there's a significant part of the year where you're really not getting enough from realistic sun exposure. So that gives an idea of the 
the limit the complexity of sun as a source of vitamin D. The final dimension I'll mention is uh, skin type. Uh, light easily burned skin uh, is what's assumed in this. Uh, if you had what would sometimes be called olive or light brown skin, then you probably only make about half that amount of vitamin D. And uh, if you're very dark skin, about a quarter. Uh, so you have a lot of people in this country uh, who will struggle uh, through most of the year to get a good amount of vitamin D from sunshine. Okay. Uh, vitamin D and COVID-19, I was asked to cover, is very topical. Uh, and it's been talked about as a possibility from the start of the pandemic that vitamin D supplementation might reduce risk. Uh, there has been previous research, more extensive research on other respiratory disease, and that suggests a modest benefit from vitamin D supplements, but probably only if you have low initial vitamin D levels. And there's been some preliminary trials on COVID-19 that have reported promising results. Uh, and on the basis of all this, a group of Irish scientists recently, I think just two days ago, came out in favour of vitamin D supplementation to reduce COVID-19 risk, and they were recommending 20 micrograms a day. However, uh, not all the evidence points that way. In fact, some evidence points against a benefit. And there was a very large study done through the UK Biobank pro project, which has about half a million people involved in it, where they measure uh, ge genetic factors, blood levels, a lot of information. And they confirmed that there was a much higher risk of infection in black and South Asian people, uh, but they found no association between the measured blood vitamin D levels from a few years ago and risk of COVID-19 infection. So that counts significantly against it. I would say that we, what we need really is a proper randomized trial so where you really very systematically, randomly assign people either to vitamin D supplementation or to a placebo. Uh, nobody knows who's got what. You measure the outcomes, then you analyze it, then you get your answer. To my knowledge, we haven't got a proper randomized trial yet. We've got some pilot studies, but nothing really solid. So we can't be confident that vitamin D supplementation will be useful for COVID-19. Uh, but I think the evidence is good enough to strengthen the case for general vitamin D supplementation. And um, even if you wouldn't normally bother to supplement it, uh, it I think it would be prudent to do it in the current circumstance. So recommendations, uh, Public Health England have recommended 10 micrograms, a few years ago recommended 10 micrograms a day for everyone in winter. Uh, but they have a lot of qualifications on that. They say some of us are at more risk of not having enough vitamin D even in spring and summer, including those with dark skin, such as those from an Afri with African, African Caribbean or South Asian background, those who are not outdoors often, those in care homes, and those who cover up most of the skin when outdoors. They could have added those who wear sunblock uh, routinely when outdoors. And in practice, that covers quite a few people. I would recommend 20 micrograms of vitamin D3 a day for vegans. Uh, you need to make sure the D3 is vegan, because most D3 is not. Uh, and to take that all year round, unless you're confident that you're safely meeting your needs from sunshine uh, by frequent short exposure of skin without sunblock. And anyone who spends the winter in the UK, really forget it in terms of doing it from sunshine and take a supplement between at least October and March. But I would actually recommend taking it year round. So vitamin B12, that's the one with least qualifications. Vegans need to make sure they get it. The omnivores uh, get perfectly ample amounts uh, from animal foods as long as they don't have malabsorption. Uh, but when they compare vegans to omnivores in the UK, it was really chalk and cheese, the 
Uh, I know Paul, I think Paul Appleby joined the, the meeting. He is involved in one study they found that 1% of the omnivores were deficient in that study and about 50% of the vegans. I hope it's a bit better now. Uh, there are an increasing number of fortified foods available, which will help. But really, vitamin B12, you should be taking specific, every vegan should be taking specific steps to make sure they're getting enough. Recommendations do vary around the world. Uh, the UK recommendations are one and a half micrograms a day. They're unusually low compared with most developed countries, which tend to range from about two and a half to four micrograms. The current EU recommendation is four. Uh, and the recommendations generally assume multiple intakes across the day, day which gives you high absorption. So the main question for vegans, uh, well, first of all, I would plump sort of towards the higher end of these international recommendations, go for about three micrograms. Uh, and but then the question is, how do you generalize that depending on how you take it? Now, if you're taking three micrograms a day, split across at least two occasions, at least four hours apart, uh, then that's pretty much equivalent to the standard recommendation of three micrograms a day. Your absorption should be similar to people consuming an omnivorous diet. Or you could take 10 micrograms as a daily supplement. Or if you take 2,000 micrograms as a weekly supplement. Now, at first sight, it looks bizarre how rapidly the amount goes up. You go from twice a day to once a day, you go from three to 10, you go from daily to weekly, you go from 10 to 2,000. I'll explain in the next slide exactly why that is. But the key point is that each of these recommendations gives the same absorbed amount of B12, and that's what matters. So it gives about one and a half micrograms a day of absorbed B12. Now, to put this in context, uh, most UK omnivores comfortably exceed the recommendation, even the international ones, well, on the UK ones, uh, and they'll absorb slightly more than the one and a half micrograms. But it's actually not clear whether the higher amounts than the use in the recommendations give any benefit. They probably don't. But if you do want to match, uh, towards getting into the higher end of omnivorous intakes in the UK, then if you took the 10 microgram daily supplement and split it in two, and you took the second half at least five or four or five hours later, uh, you would exceed the average B12 absorption in the UK. So if you wanted to be super cautious, uh, you could use the split daily supplement, and that would give you a higher absorbed amount. Whether you need to do that, uh, I don't think the evidence really says you do. Uh, but if you're inclined to be cautious and prudent, uh, it's, it's an easy way to do it. And that uh, split supplement is actually what I do. And uh, with the Fedg1 supplement, it's very easy to fill it with your teeth or you can get a pill cutter. And this graph shows why the recommendations vary so much depending on how frequently you take it. And this shows for a single intake of vitamin B12, the uh, x-axis on the bottom shows the amount you're taking into your mouth and up into your gut. And the y-axis shows how much you absorb. So in fact, at very low doses, you absorb about 90%. Uh, Whereas when you get the very high doses, the extra that you absorb as you take in more is really quite modest. So uh, if you were taking three micrograms a day split in two, each one would give you uh, about 0.75. Uh, when I click on the screen, it jumps. Uh, so two doses will give you one and a half. If you take 10, that again gives you about one and a half. If you want to take it just once a week, you end up well off this chart and that you need the 2,000 micrograms to actually get the same one and a half micrograms per day, so about 10, micro, 10 and a half micrograms a week. So it's because there's a very non-linear absorption. Once you get beyond about 100 micrograms, each additional microgram, you absorb about half a percent of it. 
uh, whereas on the very small doses, you're absorbing about 90%. So a, a very nonlinear absorption. And that's what complicates the recommendation. You can't just say, uh, take three times 365 once a year, won't work. You just will not get anything like enough B12. There's the recap and the conclusions, and then I'll throw it open to questions. Uh, vitamin B12, uh, a 10 microgram daily supplement or equivalent, uh, can be a smaller amount more frequently or a larger amount less frequently. Vitamin D, 20 micrograms a, a day all year round, unless you're confident of adequate sun exposure. And again, in the UK winter, uh, nobody has any basis to be confident of sun exposure given in vitamin D. The sun is just not high enough above the horizon. So the ultraviolet you need in your skin is filtered out and you don't get sunburn and you don't get vitamin D. Iodine, 75 to 150 micrograms a day. Selenium, 30 to 60 micrograms a day. Long chain omega 3s Again, there's the two options, 250 milligrams a day of a mixture of EPA and DHA, or a good balance of plant omega-3 and omega-6. Calcium, uh, many people won't need to use supplements at all, but you need to look at, from non-supplement sources, uh, if you look at the rich bioavailable food sources you consume, which is you know, the, the, the list I gave in the table is pretty representative, uh, add them up. Are you getting 500 milligrams a day? Uh, if not, top it up with calcium carbonate with meals or calcium citrate with or without meals. So that covers a fairly broad scope. So the basics of a healthy diet, how to deal with potential issues uh, for using nutritional supplements. So really over to any questions people have. I always enjoy questions. Thank you ever so much, Stephen. <laughs> um, do you want to go back to a picture of you rather than this showing the screen? Uh, well, people, might, I might need to go back to the slide. Okay, if you want to keep on, that's fine. Um, whichever you prefer. Um, I think stick with slides for now. Okay. Um, if you've got any questions, firstly, if you could just set, post them in the chat box. Um, I've got a question to start off with, which is um, regarding B12, there are two variations of a B12 supplement. One I know is cyan, the color cobalamin. Mm. The other one begins with an M, I can't remember. Methyl, methyl cobalamin. Yes. Um, is there any difference between one and the other? Is 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 one harmful? Yeah. Okay. Use? No, good question. I almost put that in on the slide, but you have to stop somewhere. Yeah. Uh, neighbor is harmful. Uh, cyanocobalamin, there, there's a, a very small number of people who have a metabolic defect that affects the process of B12. Uh, if you have that defect, then you may get some benefit from using methyl or hydroxycobalamin. Uh, most likely you get injections of hydroxycobalamin. But if you had that problem, you would know about it because it needs to be addressed or causes very serious consequences early in life. If you don't have that particular genetic issue, then your body handles cyanocobalamin and methylcobalamin in exactly the same way. When it goes into the cell, the first thing that happens to it is the cyano or the methyl or the other form that the body uses, adenosyl, uh, that extra group gets popped off. An enzyme in the body removes it and it becomes hydroxycobalamin. Then it goes in and then it gets converted again to whatever form the body needs, which might be methyl or it might be adenosyl. Uh, but essentially, whether it's methyl or cyano, it has to go through the same step in the body's metabolism to be used. The amount of cyanide, some people, some people say, oh, can, couldn't you get cyanide poisoning? Mm. The amount of cyanide, even if you're taking the, even if you take, say, a thousand micrograms a day, which is much more than you need, uh, that would only be less than 10% of the routine 
exposure to cyanide from from diet uh, and air and water. Uh, it really is insignificant, even if you assume all the cyanide gets released, which it very probably doesn't. Uh, so the reason cyanocobalamin is more common and cheaper is it is more stable. So, uh, it is simply much more stable, so it's easier to control the amount to be sure that the amount of the supplement stated in the supplement is still there and still usable. And that's why uh, I think it's almost all the vegan nutritionists that I have collaborated with over time, uh, Jack Norris, Brenda Davis, Santa Molina, uh, would recommend cyanocobalamin. Uh, Michael Greger also recommends cyanocobalamin. Uh, so essentially, you can pay more, uh, but you, what you get, what you get for your money, is more uncertainty as to how much is actually in the supplement. So you end up having to pay a little bit extra more because you have to pay higher doses to compensate for that. So I would recommend, as these other people do, cyanocobalamin. There, it, yeah, okay. Um, going back to something earlier on, you mentioned chard. I think maybe in connection with um, with calcium. But the uh, Sandra said she didn't quite catch what you said. So was uh, chard and rhubarb are other high oxalic acid vegetables. Okay. So any vegetables high in oxalic acid, the oxalic acid is likely to bind the calcium and make it unavailable. The yeah. one that people often get caught out on is the one I mentioned, which is spinach. Yeah. Because spinach, uh, at one stage, it was on the National Osteoporosis Society's website as a good source of calcium for vegans. So, but they have good people there. I wrote to them and they took it off. <laughs> so, uh, but it's an easy confusion because you, you look up, an awful lot of websites will just look at the analyzed nutritional content and they won't consider whether it's known to be absorbable or not. Yeah. And on calcium, the results are definitive on spinach. Wonderful source of uh, vitamin K, uh, but not calcium. Although there's a lot in it, your body doesn't manage to separate it and absorb it. So maybe on one meal in one day, you can have spinach to get your... Um, I don't know, iron and, and vitamin K and the next day have some kale to get some calcium. Yeah, uh, I would say that make sure you get sufficient calcium uh, and then make whatever other choices you like to eat. Okay. And spinach okay. is lovely in some things. Uh, I, I particularly like it mixed in with chickpea flour. You, you make it sort of something similar to a tortilla. Uh, very nice. Uh, I'm certainly not saying that people avoid spinach. It won't stop you absorbing calcium from anything else, even in the same meal. You just won't absorb the calcium from the spinach. Okay. There's a question from uh, Paul and Galena. Is that because you asked them a question, maybe? Um, so, um, will, will the Vegan Society be reformulating Veg1 in line with your recommendations, especially for calcium? Right, the FEDG1 covers the first four things on this conclusion slide. So it covers the B12, the D, the iodine, and selenium. Calcium, I think, is easily enough dealt with through food sources. It's most easily dealt with if you use fortified plant milk. Uh, now, if you put calcium into FEDG1, it would become bigger and harder to take. You can, it, it would be quite a complicated reformulation. And for some people, it would be unnecessary. If you say you put in 200 milligrams of calcium, it would, for some people, that would be unnecessary. For some people, it wouldn't be enough. Uh, so, no, there, there aren't any immediate plans to reformulate FEDG1 to add calcium, but it is something that people need to be conscious of and think about. And I should add here, when I say the recommendation based on 500 milligrams, that's based on counting up 
a small number of rich available sources, you will get a chunk of other calcium from other sources. So I'm saying, don't worry about trying to count the small bit, just count the big bit. Now, if that gets to 500, the rest should add in to get you up to a decent overall intake. Uh, but no, there's no immediate plans to add to the fetch one. If we did go that route, we would have to work very hard at maintaining the palatability and chewability of fetch one. Yeah. Uh, I'm not ruling it out, but I, I, I think there are better approaches to calcium, but you do need to get the message out. Yeah. yeah. There's a question about uh, vitamin D. I uh, know it's all right. Well, um, someone said they, they're allergic to vitamin D, first to supplements and then to vitamin D that they get from the sun. Well, uh, the, my response is severe itching on my arms. They write, have you heard of this? Do you know of anything they can do about it? Uh, <clears throat> I've heard people reporting and having allergic reactions to all sorts of things. It's, it's, Allergy is quite a complicated area. Uh, I don't... I found it hard to see the stored form of vitamin D. I don't think any person could be allergic to and live because the 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which is the form in your body, in the body stores, without that, very fundamental reactions in the body don't work. There are intermediate compounds that are generated in the skin en route to getting the vitamin, stored vitamin, form of vitamin D. Uh, so it may be that something, some of those intermediates trigger a reaction, but no, I, I don't really know. It might also be that something else in, in the action of sun in the skin is triggering a reaction because there's certainly a lot of uh, you know, photosensitivity in skin, allergic reactions triggered by light, but not necessarily related to vitamin D. But Fred, I can't advise on that. It, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss it. Uh, you may be right that it's all forms of vitamin D, uh, but I don't think it can be to the stored form of vitamin D. But as far as I know, that isn't available in the standard supplements, though it has been used in some research trials. So it may be available somewhere. So it may be possible to get 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And it may be that that doesn't, because that's the normal stored form, that may not trigger the reaction. Thank you. Uh, the question from Joshua says, should we be concerned about synthetic supplements as opposed to natural sources of vitamins and minerals? I don't think I'm using within the supplements because you can buy, you can, there are different companies that sell supplements and some of those supplements seem to be more natural than others. Some I suspect may be better absorbed than others. Some are food grade supplements. Uh, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on um, absorption. Um, uh, mo most of the testing on absorption has been done on purified compounds. And um, when that has been compa compared with absorption from within a, a food matrix, uh, in general, there hasn't been any different. So the idea that food grade supplements are better absorbed, uh, I think is a bit of myth making. It's quite a difficult thing to test. And a lot of the testing was done a long time ago when there was uh, more acceptance of the use of radioisotopes. So, for example, they would take, uh, say, vitamin B12, and you know, feed that to an animal, and then, oh, not at all vegan, but these were the experiments, they would feed the animal to people, and because the vitamin B12 which has been now completely integrated into the normal biological form in the animal, is labelled with a radioisotope. They could tend to be using a radiation counter to measure how much was absorbed. And the absorption was really very much consistent with what you got from the synthetic crystal. There was no difference, even in that very repulsive, but scientifically 
high-grade experiment. So I'd be very skeptical as to whether the food source natural claim uh, make any practical difference. Hmm. Are, there, are, are, li are liquid supplements better than solid supplements? Uh, no, with one exception. Uh, you occasionally get supplements formulated that don't break up and dissolve in the stomach. Um, if a supplement fails to break up and dissolve in the stomach, it'll pretty much not get absorbed. Uh, but there's stand, standards that have been around for decades to test supplements to make sure that they disintegrate within a certain time under conditions that are representative of the stomach. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't shouldn't have any supplements in the market for which that is a, an issue. Yeah. Um, we've got, um, someone questioned, um, I'm from Namibia, one of the sunniest places in the world. We know that ecological evidence is often a good signpost for population level effect of a certain exposure, even vitamin D and disease. Maybe that's a statement. Um, a statement or question? <laughs> It says ecological evidence often a good signpost for a population level effects of certain exposure um, and COVID. Um, let me go on. Uh, any no. dangers? Any dangers of too much calcium? Um, I, I think it's a very unlikely risk for vegans. Uh, it's a very unlikely risk for anyone from diet. I. Uh, there <coughs> um, part of why it's unlikely is it's another of these things with a nonlinear absorption, not as strong a nonlinearity as the B12. Uh, where the body really says, well, there's a certain amount I'm interested in absorbing now, and beyond that, I'm not that I'm not really that interested. Mm. With Calcium is more or less square root with the amount. So even if you consume, if you double the amount you, cons you consumed, you'd probably only absorb about 40% more. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that amounts beyond 2,000 milligrams a day are certainly dubious because there's no reason to expect any benefit whatsoever from it. But there's not a lot of evidence of harm uh, but there's no reason to go anywhere near the region that's doubtful. Question on um, where will we? Iron. Um, Christopher, any recommendations for someone who has a healthy whole food vegan diet but has been diagnosed with iron deficiency and low blood sugar, but they are not anemic and not diabetic, interestingly? Uh, um, <laughs> Okay. Sounds like that to be a doctor, uh, something to refer to a doctor perhaps or a nutrition. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the uh, recommendations for iron in the UK, uh, it's quite interesting because usually with nutrition recommendations, uh, they aim to set the recommendation at a level they expect to cover the needs of 97.5% of the population. With iron, when they set the UK recommendation, they concluded that you couldn't do that for uh, people who had high blood loss, for example, due to menstruation. Uh, some people with menstruation have quite heavy blood losses. And when they analysed it, they said there were a sufficient number of people with high blood losses that it wasn't realistic to set a recommendation for the whole population that would cover 97.5% of the population. And they recognized that there were a minority of people in different circumstances who might require additional supplementary iron to maintain good stores. The other point I would make though, is that vegans typically have low iron stores, uh, but not anemia. Um, if your iron stores are low, uh, that doesn't necessarily have a harmful effect. It means you 
could spring back less readily from serious blood loss. Uh, but low stores don't make you tired. It's the anemia, it's the reduction in the hemoglobin that has immediate adverse effects. So the lower average stores in vegan uh, probably don't matter. Uh, there's more evidence of harm from very high stores. But if your stores are completely depleted, then it probably is having some impact on slowing down reactions within the body, production of blood cells. Even if it hasn't got to the anemic threshold, it may have just taken you uh, to a lower level. So, for example, in my, in my own life history, I had a problem with uh, bleeding from my small intestine, uh, which I didn't really pick up for about a decade. But I would occasionally go to donate blood and they would say, oh, it looks a bit marginal. And typically my heme level would be about 13 to 14. Uh, which is not anemic, uh, but when the bleeding was corrected uh, by surgery, my heme level went up to 16. Uh, so you, you can have a real effect without full-blown anemia. But on the other hand, if your heme level is fine and your stores are low but not completely depleted, it probably isn't doing you any harm. And some people, regardless of diet, whether they're vegan or omnivorous, uh, it's recognised in the UK some people will need uh, specific iron supplements to address that. But it's difficult to make a recommendation that suits everybody. Because for most people, they don't need iron supplements. Um, taking it without needing it might cause uh, some gastrointestinal disturbance. Uh, it just isn't, uh, wouldn't be beneficial for most people, but would be necessary for some. So that's more an aspect of human variation that you can't readily cover within standard nutritional recommendation. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, are you happy to stay a little bit longer while I finish the oh, yeah. final part of this meeting? And if anybody else has any questions, I'll ask them to unmute. Is that okay with you? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'll just say, um, just to finalize um, for this meeting, thank you, Stephen for a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you all for attending. We uh, have our next meeting next month when we will have a Jordi um, Kazamichana talking about ethical veganism. Um, hopefully you will be able to join us then. So I'm, fin I'm finishing this formal part of the meeting. So for those on Facebook Live, we'll be finishing now. Um, bye to you. I mean